the recording started or yes yes okay. so um, good afternoon everyone i'm stanley samuel i'm a phd student at isc and also one of the organizers for the cni network seminar series we are back with a new season for the network seminar series and this is hosted by the center for network intelligence at the robert bosch center for cyber physical systems at isc so we have a series of riveting speakers lined up in the coming weeks and we welcome each and every one of you to the inaugural talk by Professor Jay Krishnan Nair. So something, some more, something more about uh, Professor Jay Krishnan. Um, he's an associate professor at the Electrical Engineering Department at IIT Bombay. His research draws on tools from queuing theory, applied probability, game theory, and control theory to address performance and evaluation design issues in networks, service systems, and smart power grids. He is a recipient of the Best Paper Awards at IFIP Performance 2010-2020 and ACM E-Energy 2020. Today he will be giving a talk on constrained bandits. Um, before we, we move on to the talk, we would remind the audience to subscribe to our Google Groups for information for future talks. You can also visit our website for more details. Nishat will be pasting the links in the chat box and you can access them. Um, finally, we would like to request the audience to keep your microphones, keep your microphones in microphones silent for the duration of the talk and for questions. Also, um, you can feel free to interrupt the speaker uh, for asking questions. Um, if you wish to raise hands and ask questions in the chat box, that's also fine. In, in such a case, we will moderate the questions. Um, that's all from my side. Uh, over to you, Professor Jay Krishnan. Thank you. Thank you for. Uh... The invitation and for the introduction. Uh, I'm Jay Krishnan Nair uh, from IIT Bombay and uh, so today I'm going to be presenting uh, work that's been done jointly with uh, Anmol Kagrecha who is a formal dual degree student from IIT Bombay and is now at Stanford and uh, my colleague Krishna Jagannathan from IIT Madras. Okay, uh, so uh, since I wasn't quite sure uh, uh, what the uh, overall level of uh, familiarity with bandits might be, I thought I'd start with a very quick uh, introduction to bandits uh, to also help motivate the problem that, that we are going to be studying here. So the multi-armed bandit problem is a fundamental construct uh, in online learning. And the overall high level goal here is to identify the best among a certain given basket of options, right? And these options are often referred to as arms, right? So uh, as a simple illustration, assume that there are four arms. So each of these arms is associated with an unknown distribution, a priori unknown distribution. And since these uh, you know, uh, uh, distributions typically capture some sort of reward, it is uh, not unusual to refer to, these, uh, refer to these as reward distributions, right? So each arm, uh, arm one through arm four, has an unknown reward distribution. And the goal of the learning agent is via exploration, via, uh, via pulling these arms, uh, determine which is the best of these arms, right? So the model here is that every time you pull an arm, in other words, every time one chooses one of these options, a sample gets revealed to the agent from the underlying distribution corresponding to the arm, right? So that's the basic uh, model. And in the yes, classical uh, setup... Quick question. Uh, yes. Are the distributions parametric or non-parametric in the sense that are they arbitrary distributions? Uh, I'll, I'll probably address that uh, in this slide, Rajesh. So the, the standard model is that the reward distributions belong to some pre-specified class of, uh, of distributions, right? This class may be parametric or it may be semi-parametric, right? For example, uh, one possible class of dist reward distributions might be the class of all distributions that are bounded and take values between, let's say, 0 and 1, right? That's a non-parametric class. Uh, similarly, you can have rewards, reward distributions that are one sub Gaussian, right? That's another non parametric class. You can have reward distributions where all that is known about the distribution is that the second moment, or let's say the variance, is upper bounded by some pre specified constant, right? So any of these specifications might uh, define the class of reward distributions that one is considering. And so the, in the classical setup, such a class uh, of reward distributions is defined a priori. And the best arm is typically defined to be the one that optimizes some attribute associated with the arm distribution, right? The classical attribute would just be the mean of the distribution. If we call the distribution reward, we will say uh, the op best arm is the one that optimize that uh, produces the highest mean reward, right? So that's the 
classical uh, multi-armed bandit setup. So the motivating question, uh, you know, that leads to the work that I'm presenting today is the following. That what if I care not just about one arm attribute, but about more than one uh, attribute associated with each arm, right? So in that case, uh, how would the classical theory generalize? That's the question that we really want to address in this talk, right? Uh, now, why? What are some examples of applications where you know one might care about more than one attribute? I claim this is actually very standard fare, right? In, in very often, uh, you know. An arm is like a choice, right? There might be many attributes associated with that choice that matter to me as an engineer or as a designer, right? So therefore, it's very natural for, for there to be more than one attribute that one cares about. Uh, some classical examples where multi-arm bandits have actually been applied or proposed to be applied in the past when it comes to clinical trials, right? Where each arm might correspond to a certain treatment protocol, for example. Uh, one potentially would care not just about the eff efficacy of that particular uh, protocol, but also potentially about the severity of the side effects, right? Similarly, bandits have been used in the wireless context. Since it's a networking venue, people have applied multi-arm bandits to determine the best scheduling and energy management policy in a wireless network, for example, right? But associated with each choice, one may care about not just one metric, for example, throughput, but also additionally potentially about delay, about energy consumption, and so on, right? Uh, people have talked about applying bandits to portfolio optimization, where each arm might correspond to a different financial portfolio. But again, in portfolio optimization, one cares not just about the mean return, for example, but also with the risk associated with that particular portfolio. Right. So I want to balance multiple attributes in practice, no matter what the application is. Uh, so that's the that's therefore the motivation for why multi-arm bandits should be able to therefore account for multiple arm attributes. Right? Now, this is of course uh, you know not new, and the classical technique that one employs uh, to handle these multiple attributes is to some by, somehow combine them into one you know meta attribute. Right? For example, uh, you know in portfolio optimization, it's very uh, standard to define a single objective, which for example is a certain linear combination of say mean and some risk measure, which might be for example variance. Right? So you define the best arm to be the one that optimizes this particular linear combination of the mean return and let's say the variance associated with that portfolio right uh, now while while this is very standard and prevalent you know not just in bandit literature but also in general in optimization when one cares about multiple criteria i claim that this is uh, you know in practice a uh, clumsy thing to do because you know the million dollar question here is about you know how do you set this beta right so combining these different attributes into a single objective implicitly assumes that i somehow can map all of these to a single currency right and then somehow you know kind of combine them right so somehow i have to say you know i have to equate uh, how much an increment in variance means to me in terms of you know return and this is often a very uh, problematic thing to do each of these is often each attribute of interest will potentially be defined on its own scale right and in that scale i may have a sense of what a reasonable range is and what a good value is and what a bad value is and so on but uh, asking one to combine these different attributes into a single objective i claim is 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 not often uh, can cannot often be done uh, in a uh, reasonable manner Right. So therefore, uh, as an alternative to this, the approach that we propose is the following. If there are multiple attributes that one is interested in, I instead of optimizing a single attribute that combines all of these, I instead choose to optimize one attribute subject to constraints on the other. In other words, I pose the definition of the optimal arm as the solution of a certain constrained optimization problem. Right. So that's the high level uh, picture here. Uh, in the examples that I pointed out in the previous slide, for example, in clinical trials, I care about efficacy and severity of side effects. A natural formulation under our approach would be to say, I want to maximize efficacy subject to a certain tolerable limit on the extent of side effects. Right? In wireless scheduling, if I care about throughput, delay, and energy consumption, I may define the best scheduling slash energy management algorithm to be the one, for example, that minimizes delay subject to a certain prescribed lower bound on throughput and subject to a, some upper prescribed upper bound on energy consumption. 
right? In portfolio optimization, where our case about mean return as well as risk, a natural objective under our approach would be to say that I want to maximize return subject to my risk appetite, right? Subject to some bound on how much risk I'm willing to uh, endure. Okay, so that's really a high level overview of our approach. Uh, with this, I'm going to now move on to the formal uh, you know, uh, problem definition in the context, in the abstract context of multi-arm bandits. So yeah, so now let's move on to the problem formulation. I'll pause after the precise problem formulation to see if there are any questions from the audience. Okay, so uh, the setting that we study is the following. There are K arms, capital K, and any arm I is characterized by some possibly multidimensional distribution G I. Right, and this new I belongs to some class of arm distributions, script C. And again, at this point, we are going to impose no structure on C at all. It could be any arbitrary class of uh, distributions, right? Uh, so again, as usual, when I pull an arm I, a sample from this possibly multi-dimensional distribution new I gets revealed to me, the learner, right? So that's the model. Uh, I define attributes G0, G1 through GM, these attributes basically map the arm distribution to real values, right? So specifically, we will see that G0 is the attribute that I'm going to use in the objective and G1 through GM are the attributes that we will use in our constraints, right? So at a high level, uh, this is not precise yet, at a high level, we will define the best arm to be the one that minimizes G0 subject to constraints of the form gi less than equal to tau, tau i for i running from 1 through m, right? So I have one objective attribute g0, which I seek to minimize, subject to constraints on the constraint attributes g1 through gm. And for simplicity, I'm going to just represent these constraints as upper bounds, right? Um, so gi is less than equal to tau i for i running from 1 through m. So this is how informally I want to define the best arm, right? And further, uh, yeah, just one, yeah, maybe one more thing is that from now on for the sim for simplicity in the talk, I'm going to pretend that there is only one constraint, right? This allows me to draw arms using two dimensional flip figures and some subtleties that come with multiple dimensions uh, kind of get uh, omitted. So for the general case of M attributes, uh, I mean, I'm going to refer you to the paper uh, and I'll provide a reference in the last slide. But for the remainder of this talk, for simplicity, I'll pretend that there's just one attribute. Okay, so with one attribute, the problem formulation now looks like this. I again have k arms. Each arm is some potentially multi-dimensional distribution nu i. I have two attributes g0 and g1. g0 is my objective attribute and g1 is my constraint attribute. And again, informally at this point, the best arm is the one that minimizes g0 subject to the constraint g1 less than equal to tau. Yeah, that's the problem. That's how I want to define the best arm in this particular setting. Okay, and my goal is going to be regret minimization, right? So I want to. We will define regret formally in just a bit. I want to re define uh, minimize regret over some horizon capital T. In other words, the learner has capital T number of pulls, uh, and the learner wishes to minimize regret over that horizon of capital T number of pulls. And we'll define regret formally in a bit. Okay. Uh, now, immediately on uh, staring at this, uh, one uh, question that comes up is the following. And that is that, you know, what if given the threshold tau that one has defined a priori, what if there happen to be no arms that actually satisfy the constraint G1 is less than equal to tau? In other words, what if the instance itself uh, were infeasible, right? Now, whether or not the instance is feasible uh, you know, infeasible is something that the learner does not know a priori, right? So this is something that is going to be discovered as one um, explores uh, the instance. But, you know, how does one even define the optimal arm? And so therefore, how does one even define regret in case the um, instance itself uh, that the environment presented to us were infeasible, right? So that is something that one needs to define clearly you know, before one can even define the best arm and subsequently before one can even define regret, right? So to define formally, what is the definition of the best arm and uh, subsequently, what is the definition of a regret? What I'm going to do is basically uh, separately talk about how these things are defined if the instance were feasible and separately if the instance is infeasible, right? So let's begin with the simpler case that I've already kind of described. 
let's pretend that the instance is feasible right now because i have pretended that there's just one constraint each arm is really a point in two dimensional space right where the objective attribute is being plotted on the vertical axis the constraint attribute on the horizontal axis right and so the vertical line at tau basically separates the uh, feasible arms from the infeasible arms so in particular arms that are to the left of this vertical line are marked in green these are my feasible arms these are the arms that satisfy the constraint g1 less than equal to tau right and the arms to the right are infeasible arms right so they do not satisfy uh, this constraint right and remember that i want to minimize subject to the constraint g0 so therefore among the arms on the left of this line i want to mark i want to define that arm as the optimal which is basically the lowest among the lot right so in particular the 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 arm that's marked uh, you know with kind of a thicker circle around it arm 1 is in is in fact the optimal arm in this particular instance right uh before i define regret let me also define one other type of arm which will play a role in our analysis subsequently and that's uh what we call a deceiver arm a deceiver arm is one uh which is better than the optimal arm so far as the objective is concerned however it violates the constraint right so you can imagine that the learning problem can become somewhat hard if there were a deceiver arm which is only slightly infeasible right because then it becomes harder to disambiguate the deceiver arm from the optimal arm right the deceiver arm may appear to be the optimal arm in such cases so that's why such arms will actually play a role in our uh, subsequent analysis okay so this is how uh, one defines the optimal arm for a feasible instance uh, now that having defined this let's also define regret now note that what at a high level what regret is supposed to capture is it's supposed to capture how many times on average you have pulled arms which are not the best or the optimal arm right now there are two types of non optimal arms here there are arms that are feasible but not optimal and then there are arms that are infeasible right so one has to define regret in a manner that captures all of these we took the simple uh, route and basically defined two different types of regret in this case uh, one of these we call the suboptimality regret where this is defined as a summation over all feasible arms so this capital k scripted capital k is basically the set of feasible arms over those feasible arms i minimize I, my object my regret is defined as a linear combination of the expected number of pulls of those arms weighed by their suboptimality gaps right so particular in part, uh, i mean as an example arm 3 in my picture is a feasible suboptimal arm and so delta 3 which is the suboptimality gap is simply the difference uh, in the objective values of arm 3 and the optimal arm right so weighted by these i want to minimize the linear combination of the expected number of pulls of suboptimal arms so if all arms were optimal or equivalently if tau were equal to infinity then this what i'm calling suboptimality regret would essentially uh, you know boil down to the classical definition of regret in the uh, single constraint uh, multi sorry in the single attribute multi arm bandit problem right so this uh, definition of regret captures uh, those arms which are feasible but suboptimal right so to capture those arms which are infeasible we define what we call the infeasibility regret this is again a linear combination of the expected number of pulls of those arms but now weighted by essentially what we call the infeasibility gap so this is how far infeasible these arms are so this is basically just going to be uh the the constraint value the g th this is the extent to which they violate the constraint right so weighed by that we take this linear combination of expected number of pulls so this is the infeasibility regret so we are going to separately bound both of these but uh, that said you might be interested in combining these two in some in, in combining these two you know uh, uh the expected number of pulls of all of these arms in some other manner with a different set of weights all of that would still be uh our framework will still let you capture that because ultimately what we will end up doing is bounding the expected number of pulls of all non optimal arms so once we have these bounds any reasonable redefinition of regret would also therefore get captured by the analysis right but just for simplicity we are going to define regret separately for um, feasible arms feasible non optimal arms and infeasible arms right so this is how i'm going to define regret for a feasible instance with this let me move on to next looking at an infeasible instance right so an infeasible instance looks like this all arms are now to the right of my uh, so called tau boundary right so all arms violate the constraint so now if since i am doing regret minimization uh, 
I need to still define some sort of a best arm in this case, right? So the convention that we follow is that the, the optimal arm for an infeasible instance is basically defined to be the least infeasible arm, right? So the way to think about this is that if none of the arms satisfy the constraint uh, level tau, then what the algorithm is in a sense expected to do is to relax that level uh, until at least one arm actually now becomes feasible, right? And then that arm actually becomes optimal, right? So in that sense, um, uh, we define the optimal arm to be the arm that is closest to the feasibility boundary or the least infeasible arm. Another way of thinking about this is to simply say that if the instance is infeasible, I now just treat G1, which is the constraint attribute as my objective, and I just focus on minimizing G1, right? In the portfolio optimization scenario, this would correspond to saying that if none of your portfolios satisfy my risk constraint, then I'm going to choose the least risky portfolio, right? That's, that's, the, that's how uh, one defines the optimal arm in this case. Right. So having defined the optimal arm, the definition of regret is again straightforward. What we do is basically define what we call the constraint regret. This captures constraint violation, right? Uh, as a linear combination of the expected number of pulls of arms weighted by the extent to which they violate the constraint relative to the optimal arm. So that's what we call delta con, which is pictorially how much further the constraint is violated relative to the optimal arm. Right? So again, other alternative definitions of regret would also therefore uh, be captured by our analysis. Okay, so having now defined both the optimal arm for a feasible instance and an infeasible instance and defined regret, I can go back to the slide on problem formulation. So uh, we have defined the best arm. If the instance is feasible, it, the best arm is defined as the one that minimizes G0 subject to the constraint. If infeasible, I just define the best arm to, in, to be the one that minimizes G1, which was originally defined as the constraint attribute. The goal is to minimize regret over the horizon T, where recall that there are two types of regret in for the feasible instance and one type of regret for an infeasible instance. Yeah, this is what I want to do. Uh, I'm almost done with the problem formulation. There is one additional dimension that we want to introduce into our algorithms, and that is the following. Uh, note that the algorithm does not know a priori whether the instance it was presented was feasible or not. So in addition to you know, minimizing regret, we require that the algorithm should output at the end of the learning horizon capital T, a Boolean flag, which we call feasibility flag, to indicate whether it thought the instance was feasible or not. Right. So if, if the algorithm thought at the end of the horizon that the instance was feasible, it returns true, else it returns false. OK, so this uh, completes my uh, problem uh, definition uh, for constrained multi-armed bandits. Okay, uh, there's one final thing that I need to talk about before we get to algorithms, and that is that uh, note that in any of these things, both the design as well as the analysis of the algorithm will depend on the concentration probable, uh, sorry, the concentration properties of uh, estimators of G0 and G1, right? That is to be expected. Uh, but again, these concentration properties will depend on the specific arm distribution class that I'm working with and the specific attributes that we are working with. So rather than impose any specific class of attributes or any specific class of uh, uh, reward distributions uh, or arm distributions, what we will instead do is simply define uh, a certain class of concentration inequalities, which we will assume are satisfied by estimators of G0 and G1. Right. So specifically, we make the following assumption. We assume that for G0 and G1, there exist estimators G hat 0 and G hat 1, uh, such that with n IID samples from the distribution F, let us say, where F belongs to my uh, class of arm distributions, uh, I can say something about how G hat, the estimator G hat, uh, concentrates around its true value G. Right? So specifically, the concentration inequality we assume is the following. We assume that there is some positive constant AI such that the probability that the estimator, which uses n IID samples from that distribution, deviates from the true value GI by more than epsilon is at most e raised to minus AI times n times epsilon square. Right, And this concentration inequality must hold for all distributions within the class of arm distributions under consideration for all natural numbers n and for all positive epsilon. Right? So we assume that estimators that satisfy concentration inequalities of this form 
exist. Okay. Uh, uh, Jay Krishnan, uh, can I ask a couple of questions? Uh, please go the ahead. Formulation before uh, you get into the solution framework. So if you can go back to the previous uh, slide. Sure. Uh, so here you mentioned that you will raise a Boolean flag with a fe feasibility flag. Uh, yes. Do you penalize if you get the flag incorrect? Um, we will not in the regret definition. We will separately characterize the probability that the flag is wrong. Okay. Uh, so when we define an algorithm, we will mm -hmm. bound not just the regret of the algorithm, but also the probability that it gets this feasibility flag wrong. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if there is some trade-off there for getting there this will flag be. wrong. Yes, I will explain the trade-off between regret minimization and feasibility identification. Yes. The other question is about the formulation itself. Uh, so if you think of Markov decision problems and let's say uh, average cost optimality, and an extension of uh, and uh, um, uh, reformulation of that in the regret minimization framework. Uh, let us say that that is a correspondence. I have an MDP, but here in the uh, regret minimization framework, you have IID rewards. So it's a simpler problem, but you ask for something sharper in terms of regret minimization. Mm -hmm. uh, the MDP uh, has a single objective. There is an extension of MDPs to multiple objectives. Uh, and the framework that one uses in that context is Blackwell approachability. So okay. is there a similar, so that naturally looks at uh, multiple objectives and it tries to drive the rewards, uh, which is now multidimensional into a set. And uh, there are characterizations of when this is possible and things like that. So which is the, which is the extension of uh, MDPs and optimization? So I'm wondering if uh, one could have thought of such a formulation where you have G0 and G1 as two objectives and you want to drive them to some set and you're looking at what are all the sets, uh, what is the tightest set into which you can drive it and what is the loss from that tightest set. So in some sense, the analog um, that uh, regret minimization is to Markov decision problems. Maybe there is an alternative formulation to your problem which uh, is like the analog uh, associated with Blackwell approachability. So uh, this just seems like some possible different approach to formulate a problem. Uh, if you had thought about it, perhaps question. you may have some comments. No, I, I, yeah, I haven't thought about this, but that's a good question. Uh, I would suspect, so I, I suspect what you're mentioning here is that you define some set and then you, in your regret definition, you penalize by how much you deviate from that set, is it? Uh, yeah, in, in this multidimensional right, yeah. uh, reward space. So I suspect that some of these, uh, the algorithms that I'll talk about uh, will uh, allow uh, that kind of uh, generalization, but I would have to check carefully. I can get back to you later. Uh, no problem, thanks. Thanks, thanks Rajesh. Uh, Okay, so I said that, so we are going to assume that such concentration inequalities exist that satisfy these properties, right? So this is not uh, particularly uh, uh, limiting for two reasons. Firstly, of course, uh, concentration inequalities of this kind can be shown to hold for a variety of cases, right? Particular, for example, the classical example would of course be that if your attribute can be thought of as the expectation of a certain uh, you know, a sub Gaussian random variable, which is a function of, you know, some, uh, some, some, uh, you know, a random variable or a random vector that captures the arm, then of course, sub Gaussianity will provide you these kind of uh, concentration inequalities, but it doesn't even have to be the mean, even for other attributes like, uh, like for example, the value at risk, the conditional value at risk, concentration inequalities of this kind are actually known for various, uh, uh, you know, distribu arm distribution classes. But perhaps even more uh, importantly, this particular structural form of the concentration inequalities is only being assumed so that we can write, you know, an algorithm which exploits the structure, right? If you have concentration inequality, if your estimators are uh, such that the concentration inequalities they satisfy are different, right? For example, if you're talking about the estimating the mean of a sub exponential. Uh, uh, rather than a sub Gaussian random variable, the, the structure of the concentration inequality one would get is going to be different, right? Similarly, if you're trying to estimate the mean of a heavy tailed uh, distribution, the structure of the concentration inequalities one would obtain would be different. But uh, very 
natural changes uh, which adapt the you know where in places uh, uh, the algorithm needs to be adapted to the specific form of the concentration inequality and everything will go through right so this is only for simplicity of exposition rather than anything uh, uh, more fundamental that we assume that this class of uh, uh, you know this uh, structure of concentration inequality is available for estimators of both g0 and g1 right and that completes my uh, description of the problem formulation and all of our assumptions uh, if there are questions uh, from the audience feel free to interrupt otherwise i can now move on to our algorithm okay so maybe i'll move on Okay, so now let me talk about the algorithm that we propose uh, for this problem. So this we call it con LCB or constrained LCB. And remember, we are doing minimization, and so it's natural to use LCBs rather than uh, UCBs. So the uh, algorithm is. I basically, have another question, uh, Jayakrishna. Yes, sorry. yes, Rajesh. Uh, so can you go back to that assumption? Sorry, sorry to interrupt a little later. No. Yes. So do you does your algorithm need to know the AIs? Um, yes. In, in other yes. words. Uh, so you are looking at a class of f's uh, for which you know the ai and yes uh, you might indeed. not know the f but you know the ai okay yes thanks so uh, the algorithm works as follows uh, so first of course since i know nothing about any arm i play every arm once uh, from uh, epoch k plus 1 through t i basically do the following the first thing we do is we define this set uh, which is capital K hat of T, which is basically in, uh, going to capture the set of arms that the algorithm thinks might be uh, feasible as of the information available at time T. So this is going to be defined as follows. This is a set of all arms that satisfy uh, the property that G hat one. Uh, so there's some uh, notational simplicity here. I'm not going to parameterize. So G hat one, of course, depends on the, the specific number of samples I have received from that particular arm at this time. But I'm just going to simplify that and say that G hat one basically captures my current estimate of the constraint attribute uh, corresponding to arm K. So G hat one K minus, uh, you know, square root log of two T square by A one times nk of t minus 1 is the number of times I have pulled arm k up to time t minus 1. Okay, so uh, those of you who have seen UCB type algorithms before will recognize that that left hand side is basically a lower confidence bound on the value of the uh, attribute g1 associated with arm k, right? So I define uh, this set k hat to be the set of all arms for whom the LCB on g1 is less than equal to tau. Remember, the true set of optimal arms is the set of arms for which G1 is less than or equal to tau. Here I'm replacing G1 with an LCB on G1, right? And so therefore, I should interpret this set K hat as being an optimistic set of plausibly feasible arms. Why is it optimistic? Because I'm using an LCB, right? A lower confidence bound on G1. And uh, yeah, so this is my current belief on which arms are uh, potentially feasible. Right? So I maintain this set at any point of time. Now, having constructed this set, the next stage of the algorithm is as follows. If this set is non-empty, right? So if the set of arms that I that are plausibly feasible at this point is non-empty, then I play the arm which basically minimizes the LCB of my uh, of my uh, of, of the attribute G0. Right? So remember in the in the true setting, if the instance were actually feasible, my goal was to pick the arm which has the smallest value of G0, right? So here I basically do that among the arms that are plausibly feasible at that time, I pull that arm which actually has the smallest value of the LCB of G0, right? So this is again an analog of, uh, so this would correspond to the classical setting if this set K hat were actually the set of all arms. But here I'm going to do this only over those arms that I think are feasible. So, uh, you know, in words, the, what this step boils down to do is, uh, boils down to doing is that optimistically play the best looking among the plausibly feasible arms at that particular time. So this is what I do if the set K hat is actually non-empty. Sorry, uh, that should be not equal to empty rather than less than equal to. Yeah, sorry about that typo. Uh, 
Uh, if the set is in fact empty, then uh, what I'm going to do is play the arm, which actually has the smallest LCB for G1, right? So remember in the, uh, in, for a truly infeasible instance, my goal is to basically pick the arm that minimizes G1, right? So I'm going to uh, uh, you know, play the corresponding strategy here. That is, if I if none of the arms satisfy their LCB being less than or equal to tau, then I'm going to play that arm, which actually minimizes the LCB of G1 itself, right? Which is the constraint attribute. So that is how I play an, an arm, and I play this all the way until the end of the horizon, right? Uh, so optimistically, I play the, the least infeasible looking arm. This is what I do if the set of plausibly feasible arms is actually found to be empty at any point of time, right? And finally, at the end of the horizon, what I do is I again just uh, at the end of my horizon, I look at the set K hat. If it is not empty, then I set my feasibility flag as being true, which is that I flag the instance as being uh, feasible from the standpoint of the algorithm, else I set the feasibility flag to be false. Okay, so this is, uh, 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 this is a quick description of the algorithm that we propose. Uh, to summarize what the algorithm does is it at any point of time maintains a set of plausibly feasible arms using lower confidence bounds on my constraint attribute G1. If the set is non-empty, I pull from the set the arm with the smallest lower confidence bound on the objective attribute, right? Which is G0. Is there a question? I'm, somebody seems to be echoing in the background. I think the you set can is go ahead. Empty. Uh, if you could just give me a minute till I get to the end of the slide, that might be a better time to interrupt for a question. Just give me a second. So if the uh, if the said, set is found to be said you can go ahead, sorry, yeah. I okay, said you sorry. Can go ahead. Okay. If the set is empty, you pull the arm with the smallest lower confidence bound on G1. And finally, at the end, you look at the set of plausibly feasible arms you had at the end of the horizon, as of the end of the horizon, and determine uh, you know, how to set the feasibility flag. So this is uh, a quick description of the algorithm that we propose. Uh, now let's move on to how to characterize the performance of this algorithm. Okay. Now what we are going to do is uh, uh, provide instance dependent uh, you know, guarantees on these algorithms. Right? So the algorithm doesn't know a priori whether the instance is feasible or not, but I will bound the performance of the algorithm uh, in an instance specific manner. And so therefore I will have to, you know, for a feasible instance, I tell you how the algorithm will perform. And then for an infeasible instance, I tell you how the algorithm would perform, right? Uh, so consider first a feasible instance uh, depicted pictorially in the right. Uh, what I need to do first is basically uh, give you the an upper bound on the expected number of pulls of all non-optimal arms. So I'm going to do this dip, uh, you know, give you different upper bounds based on the type of non-optimal arm we are dealing with, right? So under the feasible instance, under the algorithm under consideration, if you pick a feasible but suboptimal arm K, then its expected number of pulls is bounded above as follows. So uh, in the picture, you'll see that arm three is in this category. Uh, so the expected number of pulls is at most, well, four log, 2t square, which is basically logarithmic in t, divided by a0 times delta square k, where delta, remember, is the suboptimality gap of arm 3 shown pictorially here, plus some constant. Right? So this is my bound. This is on the uh, expected upper bound on the expected number of pulls of a feasible suboptimal arm. Right? Structurally, this looks very similar to the kind of upper bounds one would get in classical UCB style algorithms. Uh, for an infeasible deceiver arm, we have a different bound. So in particular, in the figure under uh, that I've shown on the right, arm 2 is a deceiver arm. This is an arm which does better than the optimal arm so far as the objective is concerned, but it's infeasible, right? It violates the constraint. In that case, the expected number of pulls is upper bounded by, again, a logarithmic term, but divided by the infeasibility gap, which we denote as delta tau. Right? So that's basically how infeasible the extent of infeasibility of arm 2. So as you might expect, if arm 2 is very close to the infeasibility boundary, then you know you would have to pull, you know, it's natural that the number of pulls would increase because you know you you would take you more pulls to disambiguate that from the truly optimal arm. Right. And then finally I move on to a third type of uh, non-optimal arm, which is an infeasible non-deceiver arm. Okay, which is uh, uh, well, arm four uh, in the picture above. 
Uh, so for an infeasible non-deceiver arm, the expected number of pulls is upper bounded by the minimum of two terms. One term is inversely proportional to its infeasibility gap. The other is inversely proportional to its suboptimality gap. Right. So one of them captures uh, how much more the objective value is compared to the optimal arm. And the second captures how infeasible the arm is. Right. So in some sense, you can see that structurally uh, you have two terms that you're taking the minimum of. Uh, and those two terms are in fact similar to the terms that we got in our upper bounds for uh, deceiver arms and also feasible suboptimal arms. Right. So uh, and intuitively, the reason for this is that when you're dealing with an infeasible non deceiver arm, you can disambiguate it both both based on the G0 value and the G1 value. Right. So you can disambiguate it based on both how infeasible it is. And so therefore it is not the optimal arm, but also how suboptimal it is. Right. So either of these um, attribute estimators can be used to disambiguate it, which is why you get the minimum of these two. Right. So I mean, sub, of, uh, this is uh, being a bit vague here, but essentially the smaller uh, or at least intuitively the smaller of these two gaps, the suboptimality gap or the infeasibility gap will basically dictate the upper bound on the number of pulls for such arms. Uh, so, as I said, uh, this, the difference structurally in the upper bound for these arms is because you can disambiguate this both in terms of the mean gap as well as the infeasibility gap. OK, so this is how we upper bound the probability. Uh, sorry, the expected number of pulls of all non optimal arms in all of these cases. Note that the bound is logarithmic with respect to the horizon, which is what one would expect. And structurally, at least the first two look very similar to the kind of bounds one would get in a classical UCB style algorithm. Right. Uh, the only thing remaining to be said about feasible instances is the probability that the feasibility flag makes a mistake. So the probability that uh, for a feasible instance, the algorithm ends with the feasibility flag being set as false is upper bounded by one by T. OK, so uh, the thing to note here is that uh, the probability that the feasibility flag is set incorrectly is actually a power law, right? It decays as a power law with respect to the horizon. The very specific form one by T is not important. Uh, that very specific form comes from the very specific manner in which we defined our LCBs and more specifically the way we, def way we defined our confidence intervals. I can in fact improve the feasibility flag to be some faster decaying uh, power law, 1 by t square, 1 by t cube, 1 by t raised to 10, for example, at the expense of uh, you know, a multiplicative increase in uh, regret. Right? So there is a trade-off, as we will see, and we will later formalize that this trade-off is in fact fundamental and not specific to our algorithm. But in, in terms of this algorithm, uh, there is in fact going to be a trade-off uh, with between setting the feasibility flag correctly and uh, with regret. OK, but for the very specific setting of the confidence bounds that I presented earlier, it turns out that the upper bound on the feasibility misidentification is uh, one by T. OK, so this is all I have to say about a feasible instance. Let me now move on to an infeasible instance, right? Uh, in this case, note that the least feasible, sorry, the least infeasible arm is defined to be the optimal arm. So in that case, for a non-optimal arm, the uh, expected number of pulls is at most is, uh, is at most a logarithmic factor in the horizon, uh, but it's inversely proportional to this uh, constraint gap, right? So this is how much more uh, that other arm is infeasible compared to the optimal arm, right? This is also not terribly unexpected because of the fact that um, in the case of an infeasible arm, uh, essentially the problem boils down to minimizing G1. Right. And yet compared to a, say a classical UCB algorithm on just minimizing you uh, G1 would give you, you see that there are some additional constants in the regret. In particular, there's an additional uh, additive uh, you know, term of capital K, which is the number of arms that shows up here, which does not, for example, show up before and which would not show up in a classical UCB style minimization of G1. And that's because of the fact that you know you only can do this after having determined that the instance is infeasible, right? So it takes the algorithm some time to be sure that the instance is in fact infeasible, and then actually start playing the arm that seems to have the smallest value of G1, right? So that therefore gives you a slight bump as opposed to a classical algorithm which only focused on minimizing G1. Okay. Uh, 
in this case, the probability that the feasibility flag is true, remember that's that's a mistake because the instance is infeasible, is at most capital K by T, right? And this is in particular true for capital T or horizon, which is larger than some instance specific threshold, right? So these two things, the fact that uh, there is a, uh, an additional constant K and there is a lower bound on uh, the horizon length beyond which this applies, all of this is basically because of the fact that I have to, you know, the algorithm is going to take some time to first figure out that this instance looks infeasible, right? So structurally almost the same as the regret uh, as you would get by just minimizing G1, except of course the difference. The additional constant term, as I said, is because of the time taken by the algorithm to detect uh, infeasibility. Similarly, again, structurally the same kind of misidentification uh, probability as before, but you get this additional factor of K because you have to now wait for all K essentially, uh, you know, estimators to concentrate, right? So that's kind of why uh, you see this additional factor. And this, again, this instance dependent lower bound comes again from the additional time it takes for you to, uh, you know, quote unquote, detect infeasibility. Okay, so that is uh, the performance for an infeasible instance. So to summarize, the algorithm that we have proposed essentially provides logarithmic regret, right? And it gives you a power law probability of feasibility misidentification. Right? The very specific power law that I presented is, is, is not important, but the point is that this class of algorithms will in fact give you a power law probability of feasibility misidentification. So the next natural question to ask is, of course, that can one do better? Right? Um, in particular, one might uh, be tempted to, uh, one might ask, uh, can the probability uh, of uh, you know, mis uh, misidentification, for example, decay exponentially with respect to the horizon rather than as a power law? Right? Those are natural questions to ask. And so that uh, brings us to understanding uh, uh, algorithm agnostic uh, instance dependent lower bounds for this particular problem. So I, so, uh, we have a general lower bound statement, which I will not present here. What I will present is a couple of consequences of that lower bound statement, which are perhaps uh, you know, more important from the standpoint of this talk. So before I get to uh, the lower bound statements that we can make, uh, let me define a policy to be consistent. This is a classical definition of consistency for regret minimizing algorithms. A policy is consistent over some class of uh, you know, arm distribution C, if the expected number of pulls of any non-optimal arm is essentially little low of T raised to A for all positive A, right? So, in some, so for example, if the expected number of pulls of non-optimal arms is logarithmic or polylogarithmic, um, then uh, the policy would in fact be consistent, right? So the lower bounds that we present will apply for consistent algorithms because consistency is like a first order condition for the algorithm to be reasonable in the first place, right? So if your algorithm is not even consistent, you know, why do we care? Um, so our first result is the following. Uh, so first we show that there exists some feasible instance, nu comma tau, where nu is the vector of arm distributions. Tau is of course my constraint level. And an infeasible instance where I change the arm distributions, but not the tau, right? So I can construct two such instances such that under any consistent policy, uh, the following is true. The log of the probability that the feasibility flag under new, which is the feasible instance is false, plus the probability that under new prime, the feasibility flag is, is true, which is again a mistake. The sum of the probabilities of these mistakes under the two instances satisfies the, the statement that log of the sum uh, divided by t has a limit of uh, zero. More specifically, the negative log of this sum uh, divided by t has a limit which is less than or equal to zero. Now, how do I um, read this? Now, note that if each of these were exponentially decaying in the horizon, right? Each of these probabilities were exponentially decaying in the horizon, then the sum would be exponentially decaying in the horizon, in which case the limit under consideration would in fact be strictly positive. So the fact that this limit is less than or equal to zero implies that both these terms, both these probabilities of misidentification cannot possibly decay exponentially, right? So what this tells you is that consistent algorithms, algorithms that are, you know, quote unquote, good with respect to regret, cannot possibly guarantee an exponentially decaying probability of feasibility misidentification on every instance, right? So there is therefore a, uh, you know, a fundamental conflict between regret minimization and feasibility identification.
if you did not care about regret minimization right if you only cared about feasibility identification then it's very easy to come up with algorithms which will give you an exponentially decaying probability of misidentification however uh, you know once you want to do regret minimization it turns out that you cannot get exponentially decaying uh, probability of uh, feasibility misidentification right this is in fact uh, uh, fundamentally very similar to another uh, you know classical result in the bandit literature which tells you that regret minimization is fundamentally conflicted with the identification of the optimal arm right so in one case i want to minimize regret in the other case i simply want to identify the optimal arm it turns out that algorithms that are good for regret minimization are not that good for simply identifying the the best arm they would typically have a power law decaying probability of identifying the you know misidentifying the best arm and uh, algorithms that actually give you exponential decaying probability of misidentifying the best arm would in fact have, tend to have linear regret right so this tension is already known in the classical setting between regret minimization and best arm identification it turns out a similar uh, tension also holds between Uh, regret minimization and feasibility identification okay so that's our first uh, you know lower bound related result the second is with respect to the regret so remember we stated these upper bounds on regret where for certain types of arms for different types of arms different gaps actually showed up in our upper bounds so we would like to show that in fact those gaps are in fact tight right that that those gaps are in you know that 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 form of gap is in fact fundamental right so to illustrate this we will assume this very specific form uh, which is that the arms are two dimensional independent gaussian uh, random vectors each of the components being independent and having unit variance right so each each arm is characterized by a 2d iid gaussian random vector uh, with unit variance right and i'm going to say that g0 is basically the mean of the first dimension of the, of this gaussian random vector and g1 is simply the mean of the second dimension of my gaussian random vector so this is the specific arm class distribution uh, and the specific definition of attributes under which we will establish this lower bound okay. in that case what we say is the following under any consistent policy uh, for a feasible instance the following is true for a feasible suboptimal arm k Uh, the limb in of the ratio of the expected number of pulls of that arm divided by log t is going to be at least one divided by the the suboptimality gap of that particular arm, right? So this is similar to the kind of gap that we had in our upper bounds, except that this statement is asymptotic, whereas our upper bounds were non-asymptotic, right? Similarly, for an infeasible deceiver arm, our lower our asymptotic lower bound is determined by one divided by the a uh, square of the infeasibility gap which again tells you that that dependence you know is somewhat fundamental and finally for a for an infeasible but non deceiver arm uh the lower bound uh in this case is going to be given by 1 divided by the larger of the suboptimality gap and the infeasibility gap again this is structurally the kind of uh, uh bound that we had in the case of our uh, upper bounds right so in that sense uh, one can claim that the algorithm that we in fact suggested is asymptotically at least optimal for regret up to some universal multiplicative factors right so um, i have not been very precise with the multiplicative factors on the right so i just wrote them as one uh, but yeah there are some multiplicative factors here which of course don't match the multiplicative factors from our upper bound but up to universal constants uh, the algorithm that we propose is in fact uh, optimal asymptotically optimal for regret okay uh, so that more or less brings me to the end of my uh, talk so to summarize what we did is defined uh, this formulation of a constrained multi arm bandit setting where the best arm is defined for feasible instances at least as one that optimizes one attribute subject to constraints on others we have proposed near optimal algorithms for regret minimization uh one uh, somewhat non classical dimension that this problem formulation brings into the picture is this question of feasibility identification right i don't know a priori whether the instance that i am presented with is feasible so the algorithm could actually also figure that out along the way so we bring that into the picture and we also you know the algorithm that we propose can in fact perform feasibility identification and interestingly we are able to identify a feasible a fundamental trade off between feasibility identification and uh, regret minimization 
right? So uh, that was the high level description of the talk. Uh, for details, uh, I invite you to take a look at um, our paper, which can be found at this link. So yeah, I am happy to take questions now. Thank you, Professor, for the wonderful talk. We have some time for sessions. Please stream please. Thank you, Professor. 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 Thank you,
maybe I'll make one more remark uh, about my black belt approachability idea. So if you can go back to that uh, set of figures where you had G1 and G2, uh, any one figure where we had G1, G2 and the points. And you, uh, yeah, yeah, I think this, okay. this would be good. So uh, really what you're trying to do is uh, you want to be to the left of this tau and you want to be as uh, um, low as possible uh, with respect to uh, uh, the y dimension, the uh, the uh, um, uh, the g0 g0 right, yeah, g0 dimension. Yes. So uh, it uh, except that it looks like you're looking for um, uh, um, not performing that well in one dimension, cost in one particular way, and not performing well in the other dimension. That is the gap in the other dimension, cost in another way. So uh, it seems like. There is at least superficially some connection to the Blackwell approachability question of uh, driving uh, something to the left of tau and as far below as possible. So, uh, right. if you if you were to draw a horizontal line just between uh, separating one and three, then you want to drive it into that set, and uh, there seems to be some connection to that uh, idea. Of course, you're asking stronger questions here. It's not enough to just drive there. You're looking at uh, how far away are you? How how much closer to this one can you push it without uh, pushing it too far down? That makes it infeasible and things like that. So, so right. and even the set is yeah. not. Uh, yeah, the set isn't predefined, right? Because I don't know if there are any arms in that particular region in the first place. So if there aren't, then you are supposed to adapt. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Just a comment. Thank you. I think uh, we are up question. for time. Uh, is there any other question? Yeah, uh, can I ask one question? Sure, sure. Please sure. Go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, there was a bound which had that K term for the non deceiver, non optimal arms. Uh, could you comment more on why that K appears? Uh, I assume it should be no, no better than. Uh, I mean, no harder than finding a non-optimal deceiver arm, right? So why is a non-deceiver arm harder to detect than a deceiver arm? Uh, I can understand that. Why is A? Can you go to the slide? We have the plus K term. Oh, that's beyond. Just a moment. Yes. Is this the is this the bound that you are referring to? Yes, this is the bound. So okay, could you give us more intuition on why that term K appears here? Uh, sure, sure, sure. So the point is the, that in the, uh, in the case of a infeasible instance. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that you only start playing the arm, which is the which 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 is uh, uh, you know which is the smallest value of the of of G1, which is which was originally your constraint attribute. Once all the other, all the arms look infeasible, right? So you, in some sense, have to wait for the, uh, you know, the uh, you have to wait for the estimators of all arms on G1 to concentrate before you even start playing this particular uh, thing. So you have to wait for these confidence intervals to basically shrink enough so that all arms end up looking like they are to the right of the tau boundary before you even start playing this arm preferentially. So that's that is what is different from uh, classically just playing, for example, the smallest LCB on the G1 attribute. You only start doing that after all the arms have essentially, quote unquote, moved to the right of the tau boundary. Got it. Got Are there any more questions from the audience? Um, if not, I think we are up for time. Um, I think it was a very wonderful talk. Thank you, Professor Jay Krishnan, for having us over. Um, so we look forward to you attending more of our talks. Uh, the link is also available uh, for everyone uh, who have attended today. I thank you once again. Um, the link, the website link, I've pasted on the chat. Uh, also, the group, Google Groups link is available. So please do subscribe to the Google Groups link so that uh, you know you can get further notification from um, you know uh, future talks. We have another talk next week, same time. Hope to see you guys there. Um, thank you everyone for attending and have a great evening.
Thank you. Thank you.